Amen. All righty. Thank you. All right. Um, so we come to chapter 14. Um, this is a chapter that has a lot of stuff from the standpoint of, of things that can, can lend itself to potentially be a little bit confusing if we're not careful. And, and I've done my best, obviously, to try to kind of keep the, the global picture in mind uh, and move us through so that we kind of understand. And, you know, ever since chapter four, the easiest thing to remember uh, is that we're in the tribulation. Everything that we're reading about right now are the things that are happening in the tribulation. The other piece, though, that we have to be aware of is that there are some scenes that are happening here on earth, and then there are other scenes that we move to where John gives reference to things that he sees that are happening in heaven. And that's where it can get a little muddy if we're not careful. Um, this is kind of one of those places as we get to chapter 14, and I'll do my best to really, as we kind of read through it, and I think we, sh we should be able to get through the 20 verses tonight. Um, but uh, stay, stay uh, connected so that we can kind of have an idea of really what's going on. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and switch to, uh, uh, to the PowerPoint. And <clears throat> there we go. And um, I'm going to move to full screen here on my end. Got to move this little thing out of the way. And go ahead and hit this keynote here. All right. So you've seen this before. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share it again. We uh, had handouts uh, for this. And if you still haven't received it or want it or whatever, let me know. I can get it to you. As I've shared in the past, this is one of many many models that are out there in the book of Revelation. I chose the one that I thought was probably one of the better ones that's out there, at least that aligns with uh, a futuristic view of the things prophetically that are happening in the book of Revelation. And where we are tonight, um, if you can see my cursor here, we're right here in, uh, in, in chapter 14, where there's the mention of these three angels uh, and this wine press um, that's, that's mentioned there. Now, if you'll notice, I'm going to come back to here again across this vision, um, uh, this, I'm sorry, this third row, if you will. So the first one, we've got the things which are, then the introduction, and all of this is judgment. But as we come into this third row here, we've, we've seen the seals that are opened up in chapter six, and then the saints that are being sealed. Uh, and then we have the trumpets, the trumpet judgments. So everything that happened in the seal judgments, we've already uh, gone uh, as they're opened up. But then now when we come to the trumpets, um, we've, we've, we're, we've moved through these places about uh, the little book, the two witnesses. Uh, we saw in chapter uh, 12, the, the woman and the dragon, and then we saw last week and the week before the the sea and the earth these two beasts that are there um so now we're, we're coming to this place uh to where we're gonna <clears throat> see additional um announcements that are going to be made and and one of the things that i want us to keep in perspective is is that uh we're at a place right now to where it's still somewhat of a parentheses in other words um we're we're kind of from a chronological aspect, we're somewhat at about at about the middle area of the seven-year tribulation, um, and uh, you know uh, we we've got a it, when we come to chapter fourteen now we need to in our own minds kind of locate the scene of activity where before we get interpretation. This this chapter is is another one of those things that I was alluding to, you know. A lot of Bible scholars consider this scene to be in heaven, uh, while others regard it as a scene taking place on the earth. Uh, most that I align with seem to think that it's in heaven, even though it mentions Zion. Zion in the Bible references though a lot of times more than just the physical Zion, which is there, 
uh, in Jerusalem or in Israel. Um, so um, and the thing to keep in mind is that the time to be pinpointed, so this is that great parenthesis that covers Revelation chapter 11, verses 16, all the way through chapter 15, verse 4. And so again, it takes place in heaven at about the middle of the tribulation period. So we're about to look upon the upheaval that's going to take place at the end of the three and a half. I'm, I'm sorry. Was that a question or just noise? Okay. Um, so we're about to look upon this, this upheaval that's going to take place at the end of the three and a half year period or about the middle of the tribulation. And that's kind of where we are right now. So, um, when we come now from a uh, uh, outline perspective, we see first of all this announcement concerning the 144,000. Uh, that's in chapter 14, the first five verses. So let's just read that and then we'll break this down a little bit more. Um, it says, then I looked and behold, uh, oh, by the way, if you remember last week too, we just came out of a description of the mark of the beast and uh, this mark and uh, his number being 666. And we're going to talk more about that as we continue on. But now in chapter 14, um, John uh, is sharing more that he's seeing. And he says, then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb, right? That's a capital L. So we know that speaks to the Lord Jesus Christ. And with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpers playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. So let's, let's break this down a little bit. And I cannot see you because I've got that closed. So if you need to say something and I don't respond, that means I didn't hear you or, or do that. So first of all, let's look at the setting. So we're on um, uh, verse one there. It says, look and I behold on Mount Zion stood a lamb and with him these 144,000 who had his uh, name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Well, so we need to ask ourselves, okay, is this Mount Zion physical <clears throat> on earth or is this Mount Zion speaking um, uh, from a heavenly perspective of what Mount Zion is. Again, I lean, as well as many others, that it's, it's a scene in heaven, and you'll kind of see why uh, in just a moment, because with them are the 144,000, and then based on the other things that we see in here, it appears that it's in heaven. Now, really, quite frankly, nobody can be quite dogmatic about it, other than John is just sharing this scene, and we've seen this 144,000 before, uh, no, um, uh, no surprise there. You know, we see, uh, if you remember, um, the 144,000, which is 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, were seen before in chapter 7. At that point, they were on the earth. In other words, they were, uh, their primary goal, they are 144,000 witnesses that are spreading the gospel, um, winning many people to Christ during the tribulation period, primarily during uh, the early part of the tribulation up to about the midpoint. And so um, we are, uh, we're at this place to where these um, uh, 144,000 uh, it, it lends itself to the question, are they the same as the original ones in chapter 7? There are some that believe that they're different. Um, I do not lean in that direction and, and because there's no reason to. 
it's the same number. It says that they have uh, their name written in their foreheads. We had seen that they were marked before uh, in chapter um, in chapter seven. Um, and, uh, and so the scene that's there, John sees these 144,000 again. Uh, now, if they're also with the lamb, there's another indication that it is in heaven uh, because it says that they stood with the lamb and with him these 144,000 that had their names written. So that's, that's the setting. And then you'll notice in verse two and three, there's a song. Uh, it says, and I heard a voice from heaven like a roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder the voice I heard was like the sounds of harpists um, playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So there's an indication here, this song of redemption, which is really what it is, uh, there's John here is seeing the, 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 the songs of the heavenly hosts singing, and then he's also hearing this new song that these 144,000, uh, that it says, if you'll notice there, it said no one can learn that song. So there's still this, this special um, uh, situation that's dealing with this 144,000. Uh, does it say anywhere? Does it say anywhere um, how they were purchased? Well, yeah. So they, they were they were purchased. They were redeemed, right? So they were redeemed, just like believers today are redeemed. So uh, that's why it says they had been redeemed from the earth, uh, and so um, they they were they they were purchased, just like we're purchased, if that makes sense. In other words, by the blood of the lamb, and and they had this very, very specific purpose, and that was to be witnesses upon the earth uh, while they were here. If you'll go back, if someone could please turn very quickly to look, go to read chapter 5, verse 9. And while you do that, I need to close this door just a second. Someone go to Revelation chapter 5 and read verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Yeah, so thank you very much. So we don't know what this song, this song is, right? It's a, it's a song of redemption. It's a, uh, I, you know, we know there's going to be singing in heaven, um, you know, but outside of that, we, we just don't know a whole lot about it, but it's, it's a special song that these 144,000 and their redeemed will have. So it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting. And that's what, what John sees again. We're not told exactly what this song is, but it is a song of redemption and vindication, uh, which is what we saw in chapter five. And then you'll notice it's a new song. Um, you know, the Greek there for new is uh, kainos, which refers to that which is fresh and new in quality, unused, it's unworn. So this is going to be a, uh, a brand new song um, that has never been sung before. And it says that no one could learn the song except 144,000. So again, we won't be able to learn it, um, but they, they will have this this uh new song and then and then Ms. Zetta you had mentioned what was what does that mean to be purchased from the earth uh it doesn't mean that they were removed but they were redeemed as I've already said saved from among the people of the earth and they were sealed we see we've seen that in chapter 5 verse 9 where the sealing takes place and we see in chapter 7 3 so let me stop there just a moment then about this it says that they're sealed uh, also, the believers on the earth will also be sealed during the tribulation. Who else is going to be sealed during the tribulation? Bless 
Does anyone, does anyone know who else is going to be sealed during the tribulation? I'll help you. They're going to take a specific mark. Oh, you mean the ones who take the mark of the devil? Yes. Mm -hmm. So they will be sealed also. But in a different way. In a different way. That's right. Their sealing will be to, it'll be their fate. Uh, for, the, for the redeemed and the believers, the sealing that will take place will be <clears throat> to eternal life. And so there's everybody at some point is going to have some kind, kind of seal, right? Uh, with the exception of those who don't take the mark and those that get saved, there will be a, a group of people who will have neither, but they will be targeted and mostly martyred uh, through that. So we've seen the setting, we've seen the song, and then we see the separation and salvation of these 144,000. Let's look here again in verse uh 44 and 45 or 4 4 and 5 it says it is it is these speaking of these 144,000 who have not defiled themselves with women for they are virgins it is these who follow the lamb wherever he goes these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found and blameless. So what does all this mean? Well, um, we might assume, based on these, that they were, they were virgins. Why? Because it says that they're virgins. They've never been with a, with a woman. Um, uh, they, are, uh, they have not defiled themselves in any way, not that uh, being in, uh, not that being What's the word I want to be? An unvirgin? Is that a word? Well, when you're not a virgin anymore, not that that necessarily defiles you, but these are, are special. Uh, they've been set aside for a very, very, again, specific purpose. And so there's a level of chastity there that, if you will, to their God. And so um, we, we see that uh, in this situation. You'll also notice uh, they follow the lamb wherever he goes. And uh, so they are married to him. And they've been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God. Uh, whenever you see first fruits, um, it's always basically, it's, it's an indication of being set aside for a very specific purpose. Um, I, think, uh, I think this week or last week on our Wednesday morning as we've been going through the uh, minor prophets, we talked about these first fruits. First fruits were always that that's taken the very best uh, and, and the very first of the crops that was done there. And it has a very specific purpose and it's set aside, sanctified for that very, very specific purpose. And that's what uh, uh, it says they've been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth, no lie was found for their blameless. So basically, the bottom line is that they're, they're a separated group. And John sees them again here, but this time they're in heaven. So the question now is, is their work done? Okay. So before they were on the earth, before they were witnessing, before we see what they did, the indication and the implication is here now is that they have finished their work now. And, and so now we're at the place to, to where there's going to be another announcement that's going to take place that God in his grace is still going to do something special in giving mankind another chance. Can you imagine that of all this wrath that's coming upon the earth amongst all of the, uh, the judgment of God he has been gracious in having witnessing going on, not only witnessing for judgment, but witnessing to draw people to come to worship the true God uh, all through that. He's used 144,000. Well, now let's look again here. We're going to see in verse 6 to 7, we saw the announcement concerning the 144,000. Now we see the announcement of the first angel and this first angel is talking about something called the eternal gospel. Uh, 
if someone could please turn to Matthew chapter 24 and read for us verse 14. Matthew 24, 14. gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay, so let me stop here just a moment. If you do not, if you do not interpret Matthew 23, 24, and 25 correctly, there will be a misunderstanding of what Jesus here is talking about in, in, in Matthew uh, 24 when he says this some believe that Matthew 24 is speaking about in other words prior to the rapture Matthew 24 is not speaking about that Matthew 24 is speaking about the things that are going to happen during the tribulation so some have believed that in Matthew 24 it says in this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations and then the end shall come to think that if we if the if if through technology uh, and the gospel has been spread all over the world now if that were to happen that once that takes place the rapture will take place and then the end will come that's not what Jesus is talking about what he's talking about is just what we're getting to read here in verse six and seven. In other words, during the tribulation, the gospel will be heard throughout the world, all right? So let's look here at the messenger of the gospel in verse six. He says, then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, now catch this, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Uh, so, so catch this now. There is an angel. All right. I think we would all agree that angels are very powerful, correct? Um, we know that... Uh, that angels have abilities that are supernatural, clearly. Um, the question is, though, is what will, that, what will that be like? So in other words, will it be this angel and he'll be in one spot and, and proclaiming the everlasting gospel? If you'll notice here, to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people, will he be in one spot where everybody will hear? Or will he fly? All of in verse, I'm sorry. In verse six, it says that he's flying. Exactly. So, so, but the question is, in other words, is he like kind of flying around up in the air and or is he moving around? And and you just you just alluded to the fact. I believe that obviously he's going to be flying around the earth, doing this. But we don't know that. But the bottom line is, is that. This angel is going to proclaim the eternal gospel. Now, I know we know this, but I want to I wanna stop here just a moment. What is the gospel? That, that mankind has been saved from God's wrath. That the ones that he's called have been saved from God's wrath. All right. So that certainly is what it entails. And that the, the life and death and, and resurrection of Jesus was the payment for, and belief in that is the payment. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so it's, it's all of that, right? So really the gospel in its whole is the realization, the good news, that's what gospel means, is that mankind is a sinner. Uh, we're fallen. We need a savior. We cannot gain our own salvation. There's nothing we can do to do that. And that 
that as a result of that, there's a penalty for sin, and that sin is eternal separation from God and eternal hell, and that we need redemption, and that God, because he loved us, wrapped himself in flesh, came to this earth, died in our place. We placed our faith and trust in him and what he did on the cross, and if what we believe that he did that and that he was died, that he's buried and rose again, then we can be saved, right? That's the, that's the gospel. Now, I don't know how this angel is going, to, uh, is going to proclaim that, but that is the everlasting gospel. Now, God, throughout, um, throughout history, has always um, used various methods to communicate his revelation yeah. and the gospel to man. If someone could please turn to Hebrews chapter 1. And please read verses 1 through 3. And then if somebody else could please turn to Hebrews chapter 2 and read verses 1 through 4. So Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And then Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews 1, you said chapters one, uh, verses 1 through 4? 1 through 3. Okay, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and, and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he has made purification of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, thank you. Uh, who has uh, chapter two, verses one through four of Hebrews? Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have learned, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels provided to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribulation, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Thank you. So, so this is, now catch this. So God has used various ways to reveal himself and to share his, his redemptive plan through the prophets, through his word, through ultimately through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, how is the gospel today shared it's heard it's 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 heard but who does it it's the people who yeah. are saved uh, yes it's uh, they're the messengers they're the messengers yes ma'am so so we we the believers god right now is using us to be the the vessel to spread the gospel the great commission go amen as you're going is basically what that infers, and to share the gospel and to make disciples. That's who he uses. Well, when we're gone, he's going to use his 144,000, and at some point, they're going to be gone. He also, he shared the two witnesses that we've already read about. They are also not only are going to be sharing the gospel, they're going to be sharing part of that gospel is judgment. That's part of the gospel, by the way, uh, that there's judgment that's coming. And, 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 and so God, this great, incredible God that we have, has not left us in the dark. He has proclaimed the gospel in various forms. Now we see he's using an angelic being to be able to proclaim the everlasting gospel. So that's who the messenger is. And then now let's look at what the message is in verse 7. And he said with a loud voice, Obviously, it's loud because these people got to hear him, right? Um, he says, uh, fear God and give him glory 
because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now, this is important for us to wrap our heads about what's going on now. If you remember last week, we in the week before, we got into detail that the false prophet, who is the second beast that comes out of out of the off out of the land, out of the earth. The first beast came out of the sea, which is, if you remember, was the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet. He is going to cause, in fact, if we go back to Revelation chapter 13, let's go back there again just a moment. Revelation chapter 13, let's look at verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon and exercised all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. So that's what's going on in the earth. They're worshiping this, this, this false god, this copycat of God. And this angel in God in his grace is preaching the everlasting God. He says, fear God. And he says, and give him glory. And uh, because the hour of his judgment has come and to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So I don't want to belabor. It's pretty self-explanatory, but he's, to, to drill that down, the message is people of the earth, this is what this messenger, this angel is saying, you need to worship the true God and the everlasting gospel will be proclaimed. Now, let's look at the announcement of the second angel as we see uh, in verse eight. We're going to see the- Pastor? Whole... Yes. So in verse seven, the angel is giving them their last warning. Yes. Because the judgment has come. Yes, and you better make a decision pretty quick. That is correct. I mean, and as a matter of fact, it should always be like that, even for us. You know, um, I'm, I'm going to just briefly share this. You know, so many times, and I'm guilty of it too, we just don't put enough urgency on salvation. Uh on this side of, of the tribulation, Christ's return is imminent, and there should be an urgency there. In other words, judgment is coming. People don't like to hear that. Of course they don't like to hear that. You know, I mean, you know, none of us want to be like that, that person that's standing out on the corner with a sandwich sign on going, the end is near, repent. Well, but it's true, and so even though I don't think any of us would do that, our, when we're sharing Christ with others and we get to the point to where we can, I think our heart needs to be pleading with them, you know, do not delay. Now, we can't save them. And we have to be careful not to make an emotional thing. But you, you raise a good point, Ms. Zeta, is that the hour's here. And, and we need to take it seriously as we're, as we're sharing with others. So, the announcement of the second angel now is the fall of Babylon. Now, we've heard about Babylon along the way, uh, and let's look here in verse 8. Um, another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. If you remember... When we think here of Babylon, um, we have to think this Babylon that is being referenced here is the false religion that is going to be taking place during the tribulation. When we understand that, this makes more sense because it says that, that system, it, it includes also a commercial system but it's primarily made up of a religious system because she's going to make all the nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. She is this, this whore that we're going to, that we're going to read about uh, later. And so um, the, uh, 
I'm sorry, I just lost my place there. Uh, this fall that's gonna, gonna take place, and that's what this angel talks about, this, this fall that's going to, going to take place. So when we go to verses nine through 11, there's a third angel, which alludes to this, which is judgment on the, on the beast worshipers in verses nine through 11. Let me get to my notes here. Um, this is a very, very sobering thing. Let's look here in verses nine, nine through 11. And another angel, a third. So we, this is, we've seen three angels now. We've seen the first one, the second one. Here's the third. Uh, followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he also will be, drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshipers of the beast in its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Wow. So this messenger, this, this angel, uh, it's, it's this judgment that's described here is terrible. Uh, this system that is having them worship, this Babylonian system, which, which by the way, we, we don't have time tonight, but when you go back and you study the history of Babylon, going all the way back to uh, Nimrod and the Tower of Babel, and the system, the religious system, this false system and false religion that has existed all since that time, there's a reason why this is referred to as Babylon. And so basically he's telling us the message there in verses 9 through 11 is that if you worship that beast and if you take his mark, it's not going to be good. Uh, now, this judgment that's going to take place will eventually take place at the great white throne judgment. And that's where the judgment of the unbeliever takes place, and they will be cast into, into hell, into everlasting uh, uh, fire. We see the people doomed that we just read about, the punishment that's described there. It's not going to be good. Then, if you'll notice in verses 12 through 13, we have the announcement concerning the blessings of the saints uh, in verses 12 through 13. Let's look here. It says, um, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Perseverance is another word that could be used there. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Well, basically, they're, they they're going to need to persevere through all of this because the people who come to know Jesus during the tribulation period uh, is not going to be as easy as it is for us here in the United States right now and in most, most of, the, most of the, the Western world. There are places, of course, to where being a believer is, is not easy at all. And a lot of people, they lose their lives. But during the tribulation, this will be global. And it says here um, that uh, they, 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 need to, they need to persevere, which they will. God gives us. Here's his call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And then um, the people are those. And then the pronouncement from heaven uh, it says, if you'll notice here again in verse 13, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this. And this is what John does. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. What does that imply? It implies people are going to die. And they're going to die in the Lord. And it says, Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. It's pretty sobering. And lastly, um, 
which which I tell you what, before I go too far, um, there is a seal and approval of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, um, that every unbeliever must face Christ at the great white throne judgment. Um, if if uh, our unbeliever, I should say, unbeliever in Christ that has to face. Could someone please turn to Acts chapter 17 and read verses 30 and 31. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So it's coming. Judgment is coming for every, every unbeliever. There's going to be judgment of the saints. That's going to be the, the Bema, uh, which will be different, obviously, than the great, great white throne judgment. And so what he's saying here is, is that um, those that endure during the tribulation will not, not have to face that. So lastly, we see this announcement of the harvesting of the earth in verses 14 through 20. Specifically in verses 14 through 16, we see uh, the harvesting here that takes place. And there's two reapers. All right, the first reaper, look in verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the white cloud was one like a son of man with a golden crown on his hand and a sharp sickle in his hand. Let's stop here. Who is that first reaper? Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Nobody else could match that description. And then we see the second reaper. It says, and another angel came out of the temple. So here's an angel that's in the presence of God. It is a good angel. And with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, speaking to Jesus, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is fully right. Hey, Pastor? Uh, yes. These verses here are where the mid-tribulation list use. These are the ones that the mid-tribulation people use right here. These two. Yeah, they, they basically refer to this, that this is that wrath um, and that will be spared from, from this. Exactly. But, but this isn't a sparing for wrath. This is it, just a continuation. Yes, that's exactly right. So, but we know we're not going to be here. Exactly. Uh, and so it, it's not speaking of that. And so, so we've seen the Lord and we've seen this other angel that comes out of the temple. Now, reaping is, a, uh, is, is symbolic of death uh, and, and destruction. How many here remembers a Blue Oyster Cult song about a reaper? Is that well before everybody's time? <laughs> no, I remember it. I'm it's, just trying it, to forget. It says, don't fear the reaper, <laughs> you know. Um, but we always refer to the, the, the grim reaper, right? And so if someone could please turn to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, and read verses 24 through 30, and then also... 34 through 43. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sold good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemies came and sold tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore a grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you may are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat 
with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in that time of the harvest, I will say to the reaper, first gather up the tares and bind them in a bundle, burn them up, but gather the wheat into the barn. Yeah. What do you want? What was the next right, one? And then the other ones are verse 34 through 43. Okay. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowd in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundations of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. And his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, The one who sows good seed is the son of man, and the field is the world. And as for good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall the be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and he will throw them into the furnace of fire. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will sh shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Thank you. That, thank you. That's a lot of reading. But here's, this gives us context here now all the way back in Revelation chapter 14. When we come to this, the indication is, is that this reaping and this destruction that's going to take place is for the unbeliever only. The believer will be, will be protected. So uh, this is the judgment here that's taking place of the unbelievers only. The believers are not in view here at all. And in verse 16, coming back to Revelation chapter 14, um, it says, So he who sat on the crown swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. So this final judgments that are going to take place in the tribulation, which culminates ultimately at Christ's return, are referred to in one quick and sweeping statement. And so that's the reaping that's going to take place and the result that's going to take place. So lastly, we see the vine of the earth and the wine press of God's wrath in verses 17 through 20. And the pictures that are portrayed in these verses, we're having this anticipation now of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep in mind, this is encompassing all of the stuff now that's going to a picture that John is seeing of everything that's going to happen in the second half. We'll get into details as we get into there, but it's going to culminate in this reaping that's going to take place, this vine of the earth and the wine press of God's wrath. So the metaphor, uh, first of all, the final battle of Armageddon is going to take place in the Valley of Megiddo, which we'll read about. This metaphor uh, changes slightly from the harvest of the drain of the dried grain or tares of the gathering of the grapes and the wine press of God's anger. So here we go. Let's look here um, in. Oh, sorry. Go back here. Sorry about that, folks. There we go. Let's look here in verses 17 through 20. It says, then another angel, so now we have another one, all these announcements are coming, came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle, and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. Now, when you think of something being ripe, uh, 
it's in other words it's ready right i mean in other words it's ready and it's going god's done his wrath is ready the people are ready to be judged and he says put in your sickle gather the clusters from the vine of the earth for its grapes are, are for its grapes are ripe and so in other words the earth has gotten to the place now to where it's so wicked um it is the the end if you will of of this time before the return of the Lord, and there's going to be incredible judgment that's coming. And it says, so in verse 19, so the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Um, has anybody, how many here, uh, knows the song that goes glory glory hallelujah you guys know that song yeah all right what's it called the battle hymn of the republic right now that's what we call it but that's not what that song is about all right if you read the song there which is why part it's, of the reason, it, it, it's yeah i know I it's know. about this right yeah. mm -hmm. it's yeah. about god coming Ultimately, well, the Lord Jesus Christ coming and conquering um, and, and, and judging the unrighteous and so forth. And it says this, this uh, great wine press of the wrath of God and the wine in verse 20 there, the wine press was trodden outside of the city. In other words, this culmination of this battle, which we'll learn about later was trodden outside the city, that city being Jerusalem, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. That, if you have any type of, uh, that's 184 miles approximately. That's the whole valley. It's the whole valley. I've, I've seen that valley. And, mm -hmm. and it's going to be, uh, the blood is going to flow. Now, we, we think about how, how in the world could that be? I mean, how could there because be... God is a, I'm sorry? God, God, God is a God of grace and mercy, but also he's a God of justice. And it has, it, it, he has to be a just God. He has to, he has to judge all of this that's going on and even in, in man's hearts basically wicked well it, yes and you're right and that's the why but i guess my question is how can the blood be that deep and and so what that means is there's going to there's be, a lot of people who are going to be killed exactly there's a culmination of so many people that are going to be coming together for this now let me set the stage here and we'll wrap this up tonight um if you will please Turn to uh, Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. That's a good And one. let's look here at verse 17 through 19. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's start in verse 11. So in Revelation 19, this is telling us what's going to happen here when Jesus returns. There's going to be this battle. They're first of all going to be fighting each other. We'll learn about that as we get closer. It says, then I saw in heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Now, this white horse is different than the white horse we learned, learned about really at the beginning of Revelation. The one sitting on this one is called Faithful and True. That's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, or crowns. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed. There's a lot of secrets in there, isn't there? He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. Most believe that's the believers now, us, coming with him. We're following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread here we are, the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. This is the final wrath, all right? This is the culmination of all that wrath on his robe and on his thigh. 
He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look here in verse 17 through 19. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him. And he was sitting on, on the horse uh, and against his army. That's what we just keep read going. Chapter fourteen, there. Keep that, going. That's going. That's going to take place. I'm not happy about that. My, I'm happy because the evil are finally is going to be taken care of. But, wow, uh, and and you ask yourself, well, wait a minute, there's going to be horses. Well, some believe, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen here so I can see you beautiful people again. Um, uh. Some believe that during the tribulation, of course, they may have to revert back to, to horses and those kind of things because during the tribulation, there's going to be so much destruction and things that are going on that it's very, very possible that that's the only way they're going to be able to fight battle is on horses. Maybe there won't be any gasoline or anything. to be, We don't know. But the Bible says there's going to be horses and this great battle that's going to take place there. And what we just read about in chapter 14 is a high-level view of what we just read in chapter 19. I will also encourage you, you wonderful, beautiful Bible students, and that's why you're here, because we all want to learn, is to go to Joel 3. Read Joel 3, and that'll also put some additional pieces together. Can I ask one question? Yes, um, yes. On, back in Matthew uh, 13, verse 30, uh, Jesus tells them, or uh, in the parable, he says, let them grow together, and at the harvest time, I will separate them. So what does that actually mean? Because it looks like the good and the bad are all there. Mm -hmm. And No, so that's, thank you. That's a good question. That's why I was saying the, at that point, when that sickle takes place, God will protect them. In other words, that will only that is only the judgment of the unbelievers. God somehow miraculously is going to separate them. Now they still may die, but it's not going to be the wrath of God like we saw here. So but, he will keep he will keep them separated. That's why he says, let but, them grow together, just like we even have today. Hmm. God will eventually separate all of those things. Yeah. Pastor Ray, yes, sir. I make some comments about the sickle. They say two kinds of sickle. One sickle, one sharp one. Now, uh, as a farmer boy, you know, the, the sharp sickle cannot cut the wheat. The, the wheat sickle is about a couple of thousands of teeth. Huh. About 2,000 teeth. It's so sharp they can cut the head. Now, with a knife, you can't cut the head, it's impossible, but you can cut the grapes. In order to cut the grapes, you need very sharp sickle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in order to cut the wheat, you need the another sickle with a couple of thousand uh, uh, teeth. It's very sharp, uh, extremely dangerous. Thing. That's what even the barber is very logical, okay? and they take another sickle, very sharp. Wow. So, uh, the, the, the knife you're going to cut the unbeliever must be incredible sharp. Mm -hmm. The wrath of God. A little about because of farm boy, I know, but the two chickens, yeah. No, I love uh, that. Thank say you. Say chicken and sharp people. What do you mean sharp people? Because it's like a knife. Wow. Very powerful to cut the grapes. You can, with the other, you can cut the grapes. It must be very sharp knife. The Mexicans, they, they put in my, when they cut the grass, the palm tree, they have shikul, yeah, and they cut, the, because they some a lot of thorns in the palm tree, and they can, uh, can hurt yourself. So they put the shikul over there, but sharp. Mm. Now, with wheat, it's not a different, extreme. If you buy computer to see 
di Femmoce eh, Ruiti e eh, 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 Cicco. It's unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. We're not the single line. Thousands of lines, special people, they cut one by one. So when they hit the hay, which is very dry, they cut it like an eye. Wow. That's only, neat. only that you can cut. And Thank only you. The, the knife can cut the grains. So two different cycles for this different occasion. One is a, is a beautiful part, the other is a vicious one. Double edge, cutting through the wrath of God. Wow. A little comment about that. For you Americans, you, you never harvest yet. No, no, thank you. That's, I, that's a great lesson, brother. And I, I love that you're always bringing riches to this. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I told you tonight would be a lot. I, I knew that there's a lot in here and we do our best to understand what God's saying, but I think it's pretty clear ultimately, you know, if we really kind of navigate through all these details. Uh, and, and again, we saw a, another macro version. We're going to get into micro version again and really kind of take a look what's going to go through there. So thank you all for being here tonight. I love you. I appreciate, I can't wait to see you on Sunday. And if you can, and if you can come, we're going to, if you, if you have been concerned about coming because of the mask and no mask, we've got a separate in the fellowship hall mask only. So if you feel comfortable to come on out, we'll make sure nobody unmasked gets in there. We will, we will use a sickle if they come in. Oh. Make, <laughs> no, no, we won't do that. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Andy. Andy, thank you so much for uh, proxying there. I knew that some folks would show up there at church, and and um, uh, I appreciate you doing that, setting everything up tonight. I love you. Just close this in prayer, brother. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for this time that you provided with, for us to come and just study your word. Thank you for blessing us and to continue to open our eyes and our ears to these magnificent things that are going to come to place and that we are going to be able to be witnesses of. Lord, please watch over us as we leave tonight and keep us safe. Finally, Lord, we just want to lastly just lift up Sister Chen to you and just, Lord, just from the bottom of our hearts and our souls and just very humbly and weakly, we just ask for your your magnificent grace to just bless this woman yes. bless this family yes and just we, we close in that lord we ask all this in jesus name amen. amen amen thank you all i love you god bless you and uh call me anytime <laughs> bye y'all bye bye, bye, -bye.